Hey everybody, welcome to um, this panel today. Um, we're really glad that you've joined us. We're here talking with John Hudak of the Brookings Institute and Shanita Penny, and we are talking about John's new book, uh, Marijuana, A Short History, and the, it's the new edition of the book. So um, we're gonna be talking today on racial justice and how that relates to marijuana and the push for marijuana legalization. Also about the history of racism in America's current marijuana laws. Before we get started though, I do wanna tell everybody, please submit questions to us. You can submit them on Twitter using the hashtag um, marijuana history. And then you can also email them to events at brookings.edu. So with that said, we're gonna jump right in. Um, the first question that I wanted to ask before we really get started with the discussion is specifically for John, why the new edition. Why now, you know, what changed between the first book and this book? Well, Natalie, thanks uh, for hosting today, for moderating, and thanks everyone for virtually joining us at the Brookings Institution. Uh, that's a, a great question, Natalie. The exciting thing about working in cannabis policy is that things are constantly changing. There's a ton of new initiatives uh, on the ground in states, there's new legislation popping up in Congress, and there's new conversations happening around this issue at all times, not to mention new research, new research endeavors that are looking into a variety of questions surrounding uh, this plant and the products from that plant. And so uh, the reason for writing it was to essentially update the first edition, which went to press in late 2015, uh, meaning that a lot has happened in uh, four and a half years uh, in, in politics and in culture and life in general. And it was time, I think, to update that. But at the same time as the policy conversa conversation has changed dramatically uh, and expanded within the cannabis community about issues of racial justice, social equity, policing, and a variety of topics related to that, um, I thought it was important to build on what was the history of racism in cannabis policy and start to talk about what racism, policing, uh, and a variety of other factors related to uh, the institutionalization and criminalization uh, of our marijuana laws uh, to, to really bring that into a bigger part of the conversation in the book because it's a bigger part of the conversation in general. Sorry guys, I keep unmuting myself, I'm committing all of the faux pas. Um, Shanita, why don't you introduce yourself to us and tell us a little bit about your background um, working in marijuana. Hi everybody, uh, Shanita Penny, founder and principal consultant for Budding Solutions. Uh, when I was really starting to kick the door down in the summer of 2015 uh, in Maryland, uh, it was very, um, you know, obvious to me that I was going to have to do more than just uh, get into this industry from a business perspective. I knew that there were things um, related to policy and just the uh, industry itself that needed to be changed. There wasn't a lot of conversation around a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today. Um, so I'm really excited to see a second edition of something that, you know, I've really looked to as a, as a resource for understanding the history of cannabis, where I fit in and where I needed to help this uh, movement go. Yeah, okay. And just one more call out. If people are joining us a couple minutes late, please submit questions um, on Twitter via uh, the hashtag marijuana history or email them to brookings events at brookings.edu and again i'm natalie fertig and i'm the cannabis reporter at politico um so shania you mentioned the history um and john your book is chock full of the history of marijuana and how it came to be illegal in the united states and how that pertains to racism so can you guys kind of give me i know we could literally spend the entire hour just talking about that but in the essence of time, could you give me kind of the TLDR of how a lot of, mar a, lot of uh, a lot of America's marijuana laws, say that five times fast, are related to racism and stem from racism? Uh, sure. I, I think, you know, a lot of Americans think about the history of uh, cannabis and they think of the 60s or they think of, you know, periods uh, not too far in the past. But in reality, the foundations of uh, cannabis laws as we have them today, as we know of them today, really started around the turn of the 20th century and 
uh, cannabis law um, and drug policy in general uh, really had explicitly racist roots uh, in the United States. And uh, when we look back and see that, uh, you know, cannabis laws uh, initially came about out of fear of Mexican immigration into the United States and the term that the book uses and that I think has become a uh, fairly common parlance in the United States to call it marijuana was actually rooted in that uh, attempt to divide uh, white Americans against immigrants coming across the border from Mexico. And uh, that spiraled into a broader uh, racially divisive set of policies that by the 1920s began to vilify uh, Black Americans uh, in addition to uh, Latinos and, and immigrants. Um, that then expanded into political opponents of presidents in the 50s and 60s and 70s um, by using cannabis laws uh, to really attack outgroups. And that created this criminalization and really police state around cannabis uh, that was not motivated genuinely because of uh, concern over harm or risk. Um, the roots of this were to divide Americans and uh, really pick at Americans' worst tendencies toward racism and xenophobia. Right, and there was the, um, the famous Nixon aid quote from, I'm trying to remember the, the exact uh, way he described it, but Nixon's aide did say we couldn't arrest anybody for being black or for being against the war, but we could arrest them for marijuana and for heroin. And the summary of that quote was, so we, we made those things illegal so that we could go into their homes and we could raid their homes and we could arrest them for that. And, and which was the, you know, 50s and 60s is a time period we're talking about at that point. But can you kind of explain how Nixon and then Reagan and then Clinton set us up into the laws that we have now regarding marijuana prohibition. Well, Richard Nixon was the first president to sign into law what was explicit criminalization of cannabis with the Controlled Substances Act uh, in 1970. Uh, that set in motion America's drug policy in a very serious way. What it did was it uh, first used presidential language around war. And we call this the war on drugs. But in researching for this book, when you go back and you actually look at the statements that politicians were making, um, I, I, I write that uh, you could replace a couple of words and you would think presidents were talking about the Soviet Union. It was literally war rhetoric. And what that did was uh, that rhetoric trickled throughout government and not just the federal government, it trickled into state and local governments as well. And it really set a tone for uh, police departments across the United States uh, to attack this as an enemy. Um, and in that, it was also attacking communities as enemies. And uh, you know, we know well racial disparities and arrest rates are um, terrible across this country, and they, they've been there. Um, and they've been focused in uh, drug policy in a very serious way for decades. And what that has done was started a conversation around policing where more police, more heavily armed police, the police with military equipment were necessary because what were police doing? They were fighting a war. So why not use war equipment if you're fighting a war? And what that, and it really transformed uh, the way police departments operate in this country. And again, all based on opposition to people of color, opposition to disagreement, and opposition to certain political groups. Shanita, did you have anything to add to that as well? No, I just think that it's a it's a very important point. You know, when I was born in the very early 80s, you know, growing up, I had a conversation with my father about cannabis and, it, and, and marijuana, and it wasn't about it being dangerous for me. It wasn't about it being this terrible thing. I knew what they were telling me in school in these D.A.R.E. programs, but I also knew that I was being informed by someone who had my best interest in mind. Um, what I knew very early on from the home was that this plant was more dangerous to me because I'm black. And I grew up and depending on whether I was with a group of kids that looked like me or a group of kids that were, didn't look like me, you know, I had to govern myself in a very different manner depending on who I was doing the very same thing. And so it's been, you know, 50 years 
that we've had the Controlled Substances Act in place and we are now, you know, at a place where we are going to really talk about this, um, address the racial aspect and regulate and legislate accordingly. And if I, if I could uh, add to that, you know, Shanita and I were talking the other day about this. There is an amazing conversation happening in this country right now around criminal justice, around racial justice, around issues of equity and around policing. Uh, and absent from a lot of that conversation has been drug policy. Senator Sanders gave um, a really great speech on the floor of the Senate the other day, uh, connecting these dots, connecting uh, what drug policy broadly and cannabis policy specifically has meant to policing uh, in the United States and what it's meant for racial injustice really. Uh, and I think that needs to, it is so at the core of the conversations that we need to be having right now. Um, I think that drug policy and drug reform in the United States has to be a bigger part of that um, as we move forward with much larger issues that our country is facing uh, in terms of, as I said, racial justice, race relations and policing. Yeah, and that was, I mean, when we've, all of us have talked about this before, but that's, it's one of the biggest questions right now that I have as a reporter is why is this not being talked about, especially by lawmakers who have brought it up in the past, you know, on the presidential campaign trail, even just when the Moore Act was moving through the House um, last fall. For those who don't know, the Moore Act um, is a bill that would remove cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act, which essentially makes it legal. Um, states would still have to legalize it, but it also um, expunges some records and it provides for equity programs within the industry. And that bill passed the Judiciary Committee in the House last fall. And there was so much conversation about this as a criminal justice reform effort. And none of those people are talking about that right now as the entire nation begins discussing policing reform and criminal justice reform. And so I wanted to get both of your takes on why that is, and then also why you think it should be part of the conversation. You know, John kind of answered half of that already. So Shanita, why don't we start with you? You know, the criminal justice reform movement and marijuana legalization movement have not been collaborative um, at all. And I think it was December 2018 that I realized that we had really missed an opportunity to work um, collaboratively. When we saw the first First Step Act uh, passed. We had this, you know, huge criminal justice reform. It was pro progressive, and we weren't a part of it. And then there was this, you know, real push in the eleventh hour to to throw cannabis um, language into that, and it felt like, you know, a real hijacking of years and years of work as opposed to working together. So I think it's we're at a critical point now where you can't talk about fixing this country unless you talk about race, and it's not enough for the uh, marijuana legalization movement to say, hey, uh, legalizing cannabis will help race relations. That's not enough because we know that it does not work that way. If we're talking about uh, records being cleared or we're talking about a second chance at, at life for folks, it doesn't just happen when you legalize. Many of the systems that have held these same individuals down for years, all, you know, most of their lives since they were impacted or before that, even if they weren't impacted, are still in existence and they are uh, systems that have to be um, retooled for any of this, these other little pieces of uh, progressive legislation to ever stand a chance. If we don't bring and center race, equality in this conversation, it will all be for naught. Yeah, I mean, I obviously agree with everything uh, that Shanita has said. One of the important uh, aspects of the way I think about uh, this issue is, uh, you know, legalization doesn't do anything to fix a past arrest. And record expungement fixes one day of a person's life, the day that they got their conviction. What it doesn't do is make up for what ended up being years and years of missed opportunities uh, that have happened because of that arrest. And so when we think about what the future of cannabis policy is, particularly as it relates to issues of race and opportunity, we have to think of this as a broader spectrum of uh, processes throughout a person's life life, that you can be set on a certain trajectory because of a drug conviction that perhaps you didn't get into college, 
Perhaps if you did get into college, you weren't eligible for student loan money. Um, perhaps you weren't eligible for certain jobs, um, whether or not you went to college or not. And, and that creates a, a real lifetime of underprivilege. Um, it creates a lifetime of opportunities that could have been very different had that police officer not pulled you over or had that police officer not stopped and frisked you. Um, that is uh, something that in this conversation, I think we need to see more of. Talking about legalization is one step. Talking about record expungement, especially automatic record expungement uh, is one thing, but we also have to do something to invest in the communities that have been specifically targeted by this nation's cannabis laws. Yeah, so when we're looking at, you know, there have been steps in some states, right, recently to address some of this. Um, Nevada's governor, for example, uh, approved a plan that would expunge, or sorry, not expunge, pardon, which is slightly different, pardon up to 15,000, I think, is the number of people who could potentially qualify for the pardon of low-level marijuana arrests. Um, but when we're looking at the policing bill on Capitol Hill, it's very focused on policing practices. And do you think that there is a place in that bill for any type of cannabis reform? Um, some of the things in the bill are related to the war on drugs, like no-knock warrants are typically used in uh, when people, when SWAT teams go to make drug arrests. Um, that was the origin and, and the usefulness of them was in getting into a house before someone could hide drug paraphernalia or something like that. And it's what was in possession of, police officers had that in possession when they went into Breonna Taylor's house. Um, so that's been part of the conversation, but that's um, a product of the drug war rather than the sort of creation of the drug war itself. Do you think that the drug war and cannabis legalization should be in the policing bill or is that something for a different bill? Arrest Breonna Taylor's murderers, first and foremost. You know, this is a, a great example of policy that comes down or reform that comes down without actually addressing the root, right? You've, you've gone as far as to say that we won't allow no-knock warrants anymore, but you haven't arrested the person who and persons responsible for the murder of Breonna Taylor. So I don't think it's enough for us to try to roll things up into, we have to address these things individually and thoroughly. Cannabis legalization is not going to decrease the instance of arrest for black and brown people. I don't care, we've seen it in Colorado. The disproportionate rate at which black and brown youth are still being arrested in Colorado demonstrates the fact that there has to be criminal justice, law enforcement reform, in addition to these legalization efforts in collaboration with, but I don't want us to get into a situation where we throw something into something else and expect that we will have magical results when we haven't addressed the root cause, which again goes back to these age old systems and, and organizations that are interconnected when you think about legalization drug policy reform, law enforcement, criminal justice reform, right? Yeah, and as, as Shanita said, you know, this is a complex problem. Uh, this is a complex issue. When we look at states uh, that have legalized, we know that the number of arrests have decreased in, in most places pretty dramatically, but the disparities in arrest rates with those lower numbers are the same. In some places, they're even worse. Um, and so that tells you that something else is going on. It's not uh, necessarily cannabis laws, it's cannabis law enforcement that becomes a problem and the manner in which those laws are enforced. And so I think any opportunity that can be taken to help retrain police officers to introduce, um, you know, training around implicit and explicit bias um, and reform from the top, this has to come from leadership in police departments, um, this desire to do things differently. And uh, you know, Brookings isn't in the business of endorsing specific legislation, but what I will say is that there are some ideas on Capitol Hill right now uh, that would seek to audit police departments that have racial disparities and arrest rates. Um, thinking about the way the federal government uh, allocates funding to certain police departments, if, as we know, you have a jurisdiction where, uh, like across America, uh, whites and non-whites use cannabis at about the same rates, um, but 
Black Americans, for instance, are four times more likely to get arrested for a, a cannabis offense. I'm looking at what's happening in police departments using the numbers, using the data, and trying to institute reforms uh, at the ground level is essential. Congress is not going to fix policing in the United States. This has to be an intergovernmental effort that involves state, federal, and local officials getting together and coming up with broad solutions that work, but also solutions that need to be tailored for the specific jurisdictions and the specific problems that they have. So I wanted to, to talk a little bit about some of the ripple effects of the war on drugs. Transition a little bit here. Um, you know, the main discussion when we talk about cannabis policy is the number of people who are arrested. But there's also things like asset forfeiture that are playing into a lot of the bigger problems with policing that people are now discussing. Um, can you guys kind of tell me in your mind what some of these ripple effects are that come that's that that just spread out from, you know, what, what you're saying, John, of this is interconnected and this is a multi-agency thing. This is local, this is federal, this is, you know, kind of work me through that a little bit. I think when a lot of people, and, you know, when I first started working in this area, it was true of me too. Um, when I thought about cannabis policy, I thought in very narrow terms. Um, I didn't, you know, you think about uh, possession, arrest, conviction, and that's it. But when you think about the ways in which uh, cannabis policy specifically and drug policy generally um, affects a lot of people indirectly, I think it creates a conversation uh, that, or it facilitates a conversation where we need to think um, holistically about what these reforms look like. Reforming drug laws are one step, but reforming uh, the way in which, uh, like I said, police do business, other aspects of the criminal justice system do business. Um, the ability, as you said in your question, Natalie, to use asset, asset forfeiture to essentially balance the books of local communities. And we see uh, you know, governments doing this in a lot of insidious ways. And drug policy is just one of those. You know, we, we look at ICE contracts, for instance, to, um, for local governments to use parts of their uh, jails. Uh, as uh, detention facilities for ICE detainees. Those contracts are balancing budgets in some rural counties in the United States. Um, and so the county isn't necessarily doing this because they think it's a great policy idea. They're doing it because they need money. And no time are they going to need money more than a year like this, where the receipt of state and local um, taxes are plummeting because of the recession and because of the pandemic. And so those types of issues create this economic model around drug policy and local government governments uh, that means that there is a constant loop. Um, local government is going to enforce laws in certain ways. Why? Because they know that if they do that, they're going to get better funding um, from the government and the government structures funding in ways that enhance, I'm sorry, um, incentivize uh, local governments to behave in certain ways. And we know that's true about drug policy. We know that's true about cannabis policy. Uh, and so those issues need to be addressed structurally from top to bottom. But then the indirect effects of it um, are something that we need to think about too. Um, wives, uh, daughters, fathers, mothers of people who are arrested for these crimes and convicted of these crimes, um, that creates a real community loss. And so uh, my colleague Makeda Henry Nicky and I have proposed a cannabis opportunity agenda that helps take funding from within uh, the cannabis industry from tax revenues and funding from elsewhere to create an opportunity agenda that's targeted specifically at the communities that are hurt, hurt, hurt most and hit hardest uh, by the war on drugs. So thinking essentially beyond the plant, right? Um, and thinking about all of the different ways that this uh, policy uh, invades other areas of policy like public finance. Um, and also how it invades communities that are hurt badly and are held down because of it. Shanita, would you like to um, add anything to that? No, I just think, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> An important piece of the conversation that I think we need to refocus um, is that investment, reinvestment and um, reconciliation for all of the damage that has been done 
in these communities, uh, regardless of whether there will be a cannabis industry there or not, uh, we have data. And, and you mentioned it earlier, John, we need to look at this data. We need to look at in institutions and, and agencies that are already going in and starting to do some of the, the work uh, to pour back into these communities. And yes, there should be cannabis tax revenue that is deployed to these agencies and organizations to do this work. It should not be left on the cannabis industry to go figure out how to go fix this mess. Um, it's a, it's a, we're a part of the solution, but we certainly can't be the end all be all and we can't leave it up to the industry to do it. Our municipalities, our state governments, and eventually our federal government is going to have to do something about this. Um, and if not, then again, we're going to continue to waste resources um, on efforts that don't work, like over-policing these communities, as opposed to uh, investing in what could be educational resources, health, job, workforce development, all of the things we know that will allow these people to become more productive individuals and productive communities within our country. And one, one quick shout out, Shanita and I have been talking um, a lot about racial disparities and arrest rates around uh, cannabis. Uh, a big shout out to ACLU who put out a report earlier this year that updated uh, a report that they put out um, earlier in the decade uh, that looks at these disparities. And so for the people watching today, if you're curious um, what your state looks like in terms of racial disparities in arrest rates around cannabis, look at the ACLU report and I think the findings are going to appall you. That report was deeply fascinating. Um, I know that John and I definitely had a lot of long conversations when it came out, just trying to figure um, figure it out. I think the most interesting thing to me about that, and I was actually talking about this with another reporter earlier today, is that when you look at the decline in marijuana arrests, it has no correlation to the rate of arrests but between black and white people. So the rate, the you know, number of arrests goes down as might be expected when something goes from being illegal to legal. But the ratio, uh, the racial disparity in arrests goes up, down, up, over. In some states this year, or well, in 2018 when that data ended, in some states it's higher than it was when it began. In other states, it's way lower, but in 2017 it was higher. It's it's obvious that legalizing marijuana does not end that racial disparity at all. And the racial disparity is not tied to the legalization of marijuana. Um, but actually talking about states a little bit, I would love to talk kind of about how equity and the conversation about equity and the conversation about racial justice has changed on the state's level. Um, you know, when Washington and Colorado legalized back in 2012, it was really not a part of the conversation at all. And, you know, now we're looking at New York's uh, New York State, it was essentially disagreements over how to do, how, how to fully and adequately deal with racial disparities and deal with equity that ended up kind of pushing the bill down the road and not getting it passed this year. Same with New Jersey. Um, this has become one of the most important parts of the conversation in a lot of states. So can you guys talk to me kind of how that changed and where do we go from here? Yeah, as you said, Natalie, when uh, these ballot initiative, uh, initiatives first started in uh, Colorado and Washington, this was not a big part of the conversation. And that's true for a variety of reasons. Um, but it was uh, legalization that passed without an enormous amount of appreciation for how policies can be molded to help deal with this. Now, that said, states like Colorado and Washington have now looked back and realized the error of their ways and have, uh, through the legislature, taken additional steps to create social equity programs, to deal with issues around expungement, et cetera. And so I think that's exciting. You know, would it have been better for these things to be addressed in 2012? Absolutely. But mistakes are made and political environments also uh, sometimes don't support things uh, years ago that they might support currently. And so what it shows is real policy learning. We've, we've always seen Colorado and Washington as sort of the teachers of cannabis legalization policy across the country and really across the world. Um, you hear the regulators from those states, um, the executives in those states, 
and others traveling to other jurisdictions to help um, teach people about what their experience was. Uh, but in reality, Colorado and Washington ended up being students from subsequent states that took a very serious approach um, in varying degrees, but a serious approach to issues of social equity within the industry and racial justice in general. And like you said, Natalie, now we have states like uh, New York, New Jersey. Um, there was, uh, you know, real disagreement in Illinois before they passed their law about what these programs are going to look like. And I think there's a, a huge part of the conversation uh, around cannabis legalization right now, where communities of color, the people who were hurt worst by the war on drugs, are coming out and saying, no, you are not going to legalize this and ignore us in the meantime, as we bore the brunt of the effects of this. And so um, as communities, whether it's uh, state legislative black caucuses or just um, you know, uh, individuals coming from similar backgrounds, similar constituencies, uh, banding together and finally saying no to this, saying, no, we're not gonna wait eight years to go back and fix the problems. Um, we're gonna do this right now or we're not going to do it at all. And I think for a lot of uh, cannabis advocates, that can be frustrating uh, to be that close to the finish line uh, and then not being able to cross it. Uh, but I think ultimately, as I've said already on, in this chat, um, if we are going to think about this holistically, advocates need to act holistically in the way that they address uh, this issue. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's great that Colorado and other states are, are coming around. They don't have a choice. I mean, we have to evolve. We have better information. We know more. But this is an example. And as frustrating as, as it is to almost get to the finish line and not get there, I'd rather not get there because I know what's happened. I know what happens when we say we'll come back for this. You know, we are a billion plus in in Colorado, I'm talking tax revenue, right? We, I remember years ago reading an article about a, a community center that was built in the marble bathrooms. You know, Colorado would have done a lot better to spend a portion of that billion plus retraining and re-educating their law enforcement. Maybe they wouldn't have the decline in overall uh, arrest and still have the disparity between races. And so, it's absolutely imperative that we just say no to legalization that is not for everybody. So how do states going forward? You know, we we look at Illinois' program. They have started this through, they partnered with Code Across America um, to just expunge records kind of blanketly. They didn't say, let's look at these one by one. Like some other states have, I think the Nevada program, for example, is more of a like you apply and Illinois said, we're just doing this. Like, we're not going to see what else was happening with your record. Um, and I would say that's kind of the like on the scale of how people are doing this. That's like we're going the furthest. Um, but you look at equity programs in like Massachusetts um, and California and they're taking forever to get off the ground. Um, you know, Boston has one equity owned dispensary um, operating the state of Massachusetts. It's also the first one in the state of Massachusetts and they're about to get a second one um, elsewhere in the state. I think it's in Worcester. Sorry, I'm not from Massachusetts. I probably said that wrong um, off the ground. <laughs> John's like, you definitely said that wrong. Um, but this, you know, it's, it's these, these things are passed in the law. They're heralded. They're like, this is the first equity program. And two, three years later, we've got one candidate with an open equity dispensary. So what's happening in these local laws that's just, it's not working, you know, what, so what needs to be different? Again, the focus on cannabis business licensing as the, you know, primary objective of social equity programs, that's our first mistake. Cannabis business is hard. It's hard if you are well-funded, politically connected, if you've run successful businesses and exited them, it's hard. And so this idea that giving a business license to someone who's been impacted by the war on drugs or is um, you know, only uh, making a certain amount of money a year and that they're gonna be able to take this license and now their life is equitable in this country is an absolute, um, it's a joke. It's a joke. And so you know, I'm not going to talk about how long it takes for a business owner to get up and running because I'm not a social equity business in Pennsylvania and it's taken my partners and I since 2017 to now, you know, 
prayerfully have product on the shelves this fall. And, and so as I work with social equity applicants and businesses, and I work to incubate a social equity business in Oakland, I just always put what we're doing into context. It's very hard. And so these, again, agencies from local zoning to you know any of the folks that you're dealing with at the state level, these are, again, agencies and institutions that have not been for these groups historically. Okay, in Pennsylvania, when you had to go get your fingerprints done to apply for a business license, you had sergeants that just that would look at you and say, hey, no, you can't get your fingerprints done here. I call my business partner up. I tell him that a couple times and he's like, hey, uh, let's meet here. We'll go get your fingerprints done. And he's walking me into a friendly barrack where he knows I'll be able to get it done. Uh, another example, you know, negotiating uh, property uh, for property, you know, the requirement of actually having ownership or control of a property before being able to apply for this license. Okay, if the person got the license because they don't, they don't make $60,000 a year, where do you think they're getting capital to start this business? We don't have access to banks. And even if we did, this same group of people are historically redlined, um, uh, charged higher interest rates when they're able to, to borrow money. And so again, we have to look at social equity in a very realistic way. And what's realistic is that we can A, pour into communities day one, because those large companies, those companies that are able to get going, created a billion plus dollars in tax revenue in Colorado. That's something to work with. Now, once we start strengthening these communities, right, restoring and rebuilding them, now we're able to go into this community and say, hey, who's interested in a cannabis business? But it doesn't make sense to just throw this license out there and expect that they're going to uh, be able to get up and running and be successful and thrive when we see millions and millions of dollars that are being lost, you know, annually by large companies. This, this, this just isn't realistic um, that there's an expectation that these folks are going to be able to, to get up and running uh, any faster than anybody else or on par with anybody else. I can't top that. <laughs> Uh, for people who maybe are watching this and just aren't as familiar with the conversation, can you go a little bit more um, into detail about where those things would be reinvested? If we're, where that money would be reinvested, what are the specific kind of places and benefits that that, not benefits of, but like the specific places that that would be the most beneficial? Yeah, I think Illinois has done a really good job of identifying buckets where uh, cannabis tax revenue is going to go. And I think that it's a, it's a great starting place. And then it's up to a state to identify the efforts that they've made in the same way. And, and again, collaborate. You know, I've heard the governor of Virginia talk about uh, decriminalization in, the, in their efforts as being, you know, steps in the right direction towards racial justice. But here's the reality. It's not unless you couple it with you know, additional uh, efforts, uh, you know, resources and and really breaking down some of the things that have systemically harmed and held back people. And I'll just add to that quickly, Natalie. Um, I think uh, what Shanita said is right. This is a multi-state process. States need to learn from other states. States also need to learn from themselves. And so I think uh, states like Illinois, which I agree with Shanita, they've identified um, these buckets that are really key ways um, to deal with the past harms of the war on drugs. Uh, but my guess is Illinois is not going to get everything right um, with, this, uh, with this first attempt. And that's okay. It doesn't mean it's a failure. Um, what it means is they need to look at parts of the program that are working well and continue them or expand them and look at parts of the programs uh, that are not doing as well and figure out whether they need to be scrapped or whether they need to be reformed in a way that better reflects the reality on the ground. And so states like Illinois um, are surely going to do that. I know Massachusetts has done that. They've looked at their own laws. They've um, figured out where they can do better and they've gone to work um, to do things uh, better there. Uh, states need to do more of that. You know, I think there's this, this belief in government that if we admit something was wrong, then you know, we're gonna get tossed out. We're gonna look like failures. I think there's a lot of people, especially this year, who would love for their government to say, you know what, we did that wrong, but we're going to do it better. 
moving forward. Like no one says that and you need to do it across government and you really have to do it on these social equity programs, which are just so difficult of a nut to crack um, that states are gonna have a lot of swings and misses, um, but they also need to um, build upon those misses and, and really turn them into positives. Yeah, one of the things I was just kind of thinking of as we were talking about where, you know, tax revenue specifically from the canvas industry goes is the fact that, you know, Portland, Oregon just voted to redirect all tax revenue that comes from cannabis that goes to the police department. Um, it's about $2 million. It's not a huge amount of the budget, but it, you know, they, they decided we're not putting any of our tax revenue into the police department anymore. I think 79% of cannabis tax revenue in the city of Portland was going to the Portland Police Department. Um, Los Angeles is also, I know that advocates are also looking at trying to push for something similar in Los Angeles. Um, what do you guys think about that, um, both in context of what we were just talking about and also context of you know this national conversation that we're currently in? I think it's smart. I think that we've created, you know, this industry and especially in places like Colorado, and I'm not beating up on Colorado, but I'm just going to use it because I have the data points. Um, when, when you see that you've not equitably decreased, you know, arrests, then yes, you pull some money back. I think there has to be some accountability. If you're not doing anything constructive um, and 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 really protecting and serving, why are we going to continue to fund that? I think it's it's a smart approach. Um, I think that our cannabis tax revenue dollars need to be explicitly uh, deployed, um, and and it has to be legislated that way. You know, you can talk about housing, you can talk about um, access to nutrition, healthcare, any of the things that are inequitable in this country for those same groups of. People people that were targeted by the war on drugs, there's an opportunity to roll some money into that, um, into that area from cannabis tax revenue. Um, and, and I think that those are the things that we need to be saying, in addition to screaming defund the police, like let's be thorough with our demands. Do you think that those funds should be used at all to retrain police? They have big budgets. I think that they could uh, retrain police within the existing budgets. I don't think that there's a need to bring in cannabis tax revenue to retrain police because it's not cannabis that is the cause for us to retrain. If that's not why we're retraining police, we're retraining police because we have a problem in this country. So no, I don't want it to come from the cannabis industry specifically or only. John, did you want to add anything? All right, uh, we're gonna start going through some of the questions that we have from um, viewers. One of them kind of shifting our thoughts a little bit to the 2020 election. I know this is on a lot of people's minds. Um, could a Biden presidency, this question comes from William, could a Biden presidency lead to real leadership on legalization of cannabis on the federal level at the DEA and in the AG's office? I think there's going to be tremendous pressure on uh, Mr. Biden, if he does become our next president, uh, to move in a direction uh, where broader drug policy reform is a reality. Um, I think that all else being equal, uh, the Democratic Party would push Biden on that point anyways. But I think what's been going on in this country, um, especially over the past several weeks, is going to make that a much bigger conversation in the Biden camp, I think, as a candidate. And I think um, if he is elected president as president, uh, I think there is going to be uh, a, an enormous blowback against uh, a Biden presidency from within the party um, if he chooses to uh, deal with drug policy in a meek manner um, or if he fails to show leadership at all. Now, a president showing leadership on this uh, could be uh, done in a variety of ways. It could be done within the cabinet. Um, it could be delegated to a vice president. Um, I write in my book about how presidents frequently um, delegated to their vice president the means of building up the war on drugs. Um, it would be an amazing task, I think, for a vice president to dismantle the war on drugs. Uh, and if, uh, you know, the rumors in media right now that uh, Joe Biden is focusing on um, uh, mostly black women as his VP choice. 
uh, that would be a, a great individual, probably with life experience, um, dealing with this issue um, as a Black American to really lead that conversation. And so do I think Joe Biden is going to turn around overnight and become, you know, the, the biggest cheerleader for cannabis legalization? Probably not. Um, but I do think he's politically savvy enough to know what the consequences are if he doesn't. Shanita, did you have anything to add? No, I look to John for uh, his, his thoughts on these types of matters, especially around the presidency. And I agree. I think that, you know, uh, Biden's got an opportunity to, if he doesn't do it himself, put the right people in place to, to take this thing and really do something with it. We've never seen um, a president really take this issue on and lead. Yeah, and I think that is kind of one of the most important questions, right, is there are lawmakers, I mean, if you, I've been told by Republicans and Democrat senators that if you put the Safe Banking Act on the floor of the House tomorrow, it has the votes to pass. But Mitch McConnell does not want it to be on the floor of the Senate tomorrow. Did I say the House, the Senate? Um, and so there's, and then also a lot of those people that would vote for it are not using their personal political capital to push it into existence. And so many of the things that happen on the federal level are, yeah, 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 I'd vote for it if it came up, but they're never gonna push for it to happen. And that can be the same in the presidency too, right? You know, okay, if the bill arrives on Joe Biden's desk, he'll sign it because the political implications of being a Democrat president who signs to not, like who vetoes a bill changing drug policy would be pretty, pretty hard for him to deal with. But is he going to use political capital as a president to push for it. I think that's kind of one of the major questions. I don't know if either of you have an answer to that, but. Yeah, I mean, it, the, it is an open question about what a new president would uh, spend political capital on. I think that the um, benefits of uh, drug policy reform, like I said, has been enhanced um, as we're having a broader conversation about racial justice in this country. But at the same time, uh, yeah, Mitch McConnell is certainly holding up uh, cannabis legislation. He's holding up a lot of legislation. Uh, presidential leadership, however, on an issue like this could uh, make or break the issue. Uh, what we know is Donald Trump has not shown leadership on uh, cannabis reform policy. Uh, and I bet if he did, it would probably move Mitch McConnell at least a little bit, or it would move um, several Republican senators a, a little bit on that. In the same way that, frankly, Barack Obama didn't show any leadership on cannabis uh, reform policy um, either. And so that did not become something that Congress really wanted to take up, even uh, when he had a, a supermajority Senate and a Democratic uh, House uh, at the beginning of his first term. And so, uh, you know, as Shanita said, we've never seen a president show real leadership on this issue. And I think it's hard to exactly game out uh, what that leadership would have in effect, uh, especially in a, if Republicans maintain control of the Senate. But uh, it might also be a game changer. And, and so I think it's a wait and see approach right now. Some president in the future is going to show a lot of leadership on this. Uh, maybe it's Joe Biden. Maybe it's someone the next time. Uh, but it's going to happen. And then I think we're going to learn a lot about what that, uh, what kind of spark that, what kind of spark it is that ignites something bigger. And I think it's also important to point out how much uh, public sentiment about cannabis has changed in the last even just four years, not to mention eight years or 10 years. I mean, it's, um, it, it has, we, we talked, one of my colleagues talked to a pollster who was saying that he hadn't seen anything change sentiment this quickly, aside from the way the country changed their opinion on gay marriage, actually, it was the only other thing that he'd ever seen this quick of a change from mostly being against it to mostly being for it over the last decade. And I mean, President Obama was a president in a kind of a, a much different, was elected in a different sentiment. Um, that kind of also plays into another one of our questions though, which is why do federal legislators or the executive branch struggle to make change or struggle to get behind this issue when national sentiment is so much behind it? I mean, even, you know, I, I'm, not remembering the exact number right now, but I think it's 55% of Republicans favor national legalization and many more favor medical marijuana. 
So what I always say is that uh, cannabis legalization is popular in this country, uh, but it's not salient. It's not something that a lot of voters care a lot about. Um, and for the most part, I think that's because for a lot of Americans, uh, they either live in a state uh, where cannabis is legal, uh, and if they want to use it, they can. Uh, or if they live in a state where it's not um, legal, they're going to find a way to get it and use it. And especially if they're white, um, not get uh, in trouble for it. Uh, and so that creates a situation in which a lot of Americans see a lot of other issues that need to come to the front of the line before cannabis. Um, that said, uh, if cannabis reform gets folded into the broader conversation around racial justice and policing, um, that can create that policy window um, in which, uh, you know, everything, everything comes together at the right time uh, and in the right setting uh, and something can get done. That makes it more salient to Americans because Americans are, are not thinking of it just as uh, can you buy cannabis legally or not? You're thinking about it as something systemic, something institutional, something that touches on a lot of other issues. And those of us who work in and around this issue know it's much more complicated than I think the average American thinks about in terms of the areas of policy and the number of people uh, that cannabis policy affects uh, directly or indirectly. And so if that happens, um, if, that, if those conversations merge, I think that the uh, level of support in it, the United States for cannabis reform really starts to translate into movement. Um, we have a question from a special guest um, from Leon, Shanita's dad. Um, uh, he, Leon asks, do you see a path for small dispensaries getting online with large companies buying up all of the territory? The path is through legislation that carves out and protects a lane for those small businesses. You know, the reality is, is that even our large cannabis businesses in the grand scheme of things are small businesses. And so these, these big monsters that everybody keeps complaining about in the cannabis industry um, are, are not even the real threat. You know, when federal legalization uh, opens up and, and these larger companies that haven't taken the risk early on, um, Constellation Brands, for instance, and some of the others, uh, they're coming. Uh, so we have to carve out a lane and protect uh, the small business owner, whether that's a dispensary, a, a cultivator. And I think that we do that through legislation that, again, when creating and, and protecting the small business owner, also creates a space and protection for black and brown business owners, social equity business owners. Once we get away from thinking of social equity businesses as a charity or a handout, and we respect them and, and provide resources for them so that they can um, not only get into the space, but compete, uh, we will see um, small dispensaries uh, hopefully here to stay. I'd like to see the mom and pop dispensaries of the world, um, you know, be here even when we have the national retail chains that are going to come to fruition at some point. Um, so yes, I'm doing all that I can uh, to carve out a lane and protect small businesses. Thanks, Dad. Um, we have another question, which is, from JR and he asks, what if any recent and tangible change do you see in racial equity in the cannabis industry? Oof. Um, so like I said, I think- that, <laughs> Well, let Shanita sit on that for a second while John goes for it. <laughs> so, um, the recent, so the question was what recent change um, is there around uh, racial equity? And I, I think, you know, you're seeing, as I mentioned before, what's happening in Massachusetts with a reform of their program with regard to equity. Um, the, the director up there taking a look at what the um, uh, commission is doing and saying, we have to do better. Um, and uh, as I said before, you don't hear that from government officials a lot. And so I think kudos um, to the administration there uh, on recognizing that more needed to be done and then actually doing something about it. I think the, the Massachusetts model, uh, even if ultimately it does not serve all of the purposes and goals um, that were intended, um, I think that governance approach of admitting challenges and trying to overcome them is something that should be modeled in every state that deals with drug policy in this way and states that deal in a lot of areas of policy. 
Uh, next, I think, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the effort in Illinois, which uh, it's a new program, it remains to be seen whether that is going to, which parts of that program are going to be successful with regard to uh, racial justice and equity issues. Uh, and I think it's something definitely to watch. The intent there is spectacular. Um, the goals that are laid out, I think, are uh, really something that, that other states, sh states should look to, um, even if it's just for the goals to meet and the types of interventions to have. Uh, and so those are two, I think, of uh, the most exciting uh, uh, tangible changes, as I think the question said, uh, that we can look at and, and be interested in and want to see those play out uh, and see what changes need to happen to those programs to make them even better. Shanita, did you I like and, uh, Thank you. <laughs> create an answer. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nicole asks, how can deep rooted bias and fear be addressed both in organizations governing um, the regulation of cannabis and also in the communities? Uh, it starts with the individual and then a commitment from the organization to put the energy and resources needed to actually um, understanding how individually and organization, you know, you, as an organization, you have allowed these biases to affect how you do business, right? Whether it's recruiting, whether it's investing, whether it's creating uh, regulations. Uh, and so I think it's something that we've all had um, brought to the light for us over the last several weeks. And you see it, it's happening in, in companies, in organizations, in education, it's happening throughout the fiber of this country. And that is essentially what it takes. Um, but again, it's an individual thing. You've got to realize when you walk into that, that, that room every single day, you know, you're helping to either perpetuate or now dismantle, uh, you know, what's been going on for over 400 years here. And just to add to that quickly, I agree with Shanita, you start with the individual and then you also look at the uh, institution or organization. And one of the um, key parts that connects those two are incentives. And I think we have to look within these institutions at what those incentive structures, whether they're formal incentive structures or whether they're informal ones that get perpetuated. Because I think when you look at those, you're really going to get to the root causes of what's happening on the ground level. And what makes it more complex is that those incentives may be different from you know, city to city, state to state, or even precinct to precinct within the same uh, city. And so uh, understanding what those look like and how to overcome them uh, is going to be important. You have, a, you have some bad actors out there who are probably gonna go to work and say, I'm gonna screw communities of color today but that there are others who are doing it because that's how things are done. And sometimes they're not even realizing what they're doing, um, but they're working within this system where the incentives are pushing them to do these things. And so reforming those um, are going to be key to getting this right. All right, you guys, well, we have, um, we have just about three minutes left. So if either of you guys have some final statements or questions, um, I mean, let me just pose one to you guys, I guess, actually, um, you know, with what's going on, everything with the conversation right now on racial justice reform, what is the one step that you think the one cannabis step, ugh, the one cannabis related step you think could or should be taken either on the state level or the federal level in governments to just start the process of rectifying or fixing this problem? I'd like to start with the with the tax uh, issue. You know, we are looking at cannabis legalization as a part of the economic recovery, as a part of economic recovery for this country, and you know, it's a big burden to put to legalize at the state level and operate, and then not be able to write off you know business expenses and to have that burden. So you know, as states are thinking about this for their coffers, um, I would encourage state lawmakers to think about how they can collaborate and push on our federal lawmakers for, you know, to close and, and get rid of that gray area, close the gap of the disconnect between federal illegality and state legality. Um, I think we're at, an, at, a, at a critical place where if we do this right, 
we address a number of issues and then we become an example for other regulations and laws. We come, become an example for other industries. Um, and we really play our part in not only just being a new industry, but a better industry and example for the world. Um, God, that was a great answer, Shanita. For, for me, I think that if we go back to the issue of leadership, I think um, it would be great to see coming out of a White House, whether it's this White House or whether it's the next White House, um, a, a real set of goals, a real set of targets to hit, um, whether it's it federally or at the state level, um, that does two things. First, I think it uh, strengthens the conversation around the broad ways in which uh, cannabis policy uh, needs to be tailored to meet the uh, current needs, uh, but also the needs uh, that have grown over decades of uh, injustices being uh, piled up and really piled up disproportionately uh, within uh, a couple of communities uh, within this country. I think that's the first uh, part that a, a roadmap would help. Uh, the next part would be to uh, you know, signal to states what federal legalization might look like someday to help states understand if this is what federal expectations are going to be, we need to start thinking at the state level about how we're going to operate when that day comes and Congress actually acts on this. And I, I think people underestimate uh, what a an upheaval federal legalization could mean for state level programs. And I don't just mean taxes or licensing or things like that but especially for the issues um, of justice that operate um, uh, at the core of this issue. Um, how states are going to respond to those federal expectations are going to be key. All right. Well, thank you guys both for this conversation today. Um, I hope it was as enlightening for everyone else as it was for me. Um, I want to remind everyone who tuned in, um, John's book, Marijuana Short History, is very good. I was very excited to get my copy in the mail. You guys should all go out and buy it. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone for being here today. The conversation will obviously as always continue on Twitter where we all are existent too much of our lives. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.